A Tall and Small Collection Chapter 1 A Cold and Empty House His breath hitched in his throat. The frigid air filled his lungs, constricting them with each gasping breath. He could hear his younger brothers calling out for him. Each beat of his heart seemed to slow, begging him to calm his nerves. The crashing vibrations behind him were growing louder and louder. He had to speed up. He willed his legs to move faster as he darted to the side. The harsh sound of heavy breathing was close enough for him to smell. Just ahead was a hiding place. The roots of a freezing tree offered just enough protection, but could he make it? There was no other option. He pulled out his pin and dove forward, tumbling through the roots and spinning on his heel in preparation to jab out. His heart leapt in his throat. A hollow emptiness swelled in his gut as he came face to face with the gaping maw of a dog. He gripped his pin tight and thrust forward. Soren woke with a start and sat bolt upright, a cold sweat on his brow. His breath was shallow and rapid, every nerve in his body sending chills and nervous sparks through his body. As his heart began to calm and stop hammering against his chest, he laid back down and tried to breathe deeply against the constricting feeling in his chest. It was a dream. It was only a dream, this time at least. Soren's dream pulled from events just four days ago. Soren could have sworn he smelled the dog's breath as he laid there beneath the fabric scrap he borrowed from a discarded quilt. He went to roll over when he glanced at either side, remembering his two younger brothers, who were sound asleep, and pressed against him. Soren breathed a sigh of relief. He hadn't disturbed them. Instinctually, he pulled them closer under the cloth. Their makeshift bed on the dirt and under those few scraps of cloth they managed to bring with them was neither comfortable nor warm. It allowed them to survive, which was enough for now. Northern winters were harsh and frigid, especially by the northern lakes. This was not a contested point. It was fact. The wind would easily reach below zero. The snow could bury a yard in hours and make any terrain dangerous to traverse. Water would freeze over and become nearly impossible to drink or drill to boil. Wildlife, scarce in certain months, was nearly impossible to hunt, and often the stores closed. If someone had a house with heating and water and light, and the means to sustain such a life, it wasn't so bad. No person in their right mind would live outside willingly in such harsh conditions. But, sometimes, it was unavoidable, especially if that person was a borrower. Borrowers were, in essence, little people. They averaged around four to four and a half inches tall and got their name from what they did to survive, borrow. They borrowed essentials and little things humans wouldn't necessarily miss like thumbtacks, bits of bread, and fabric pieces. Usually they lived in the walls or ceilings or floorboards, keeping out of sight from curious humans. Sadly, some have to abandon the safety of the walls. In a small subdivision filled with a labyrinth of apartments and college town students, the family of four borrowers lay shivering in the cold. It was only late fall, but there was still a dusting of snow on the ground. They were forced to migrate after Brady, the father of Soren's two younger brothers, thought he was seen by the humans they borrowed from. Soren guessed that Brady was most likely seen, but tried not to address it around the boys. If he was being honest with himself, Soren resented Brady in a way. Brady wasn't a bad borrower but he wasn't a particularly good one, either. He had his clumsy moments, and sometimes abandoned an entire borrowing trip because he was afraid of being seen, or worse, caught. It was a miracle neither had happened. If it weren't for Soren and his mother, they probably wouldn't have lasted this long. Next diff, Soren tried stretching without disturbing his siblings. A quick glance around told him it was just after dawn, and he couldn't see Brady anywhere nearby. He felt a frozen growl rise in his throat. Gone. Where did he wander off to? I told him we should go inside together to scope the place out. He should be sitting up, keeping watch. Zorn shook his head free of his thoughts. He couldn't think about that now. He had to focus on the move ahead of them. The house they intended to stay in for now was largely unexplored, and they were in desperate need of supplies. His brothers were too young, being only seven and eight years old, and Brady was incompetent. Soren would need to handle supply gathering. 
With a gentle nudge, he began to wake his brothers. Sorin, groaned the youngest. Ray, teeth chattering slightly. I know it's early, but it's time to wake up, said Sorin. Dorian stirred, pressing himself into the warmth of his eldest brother. Sorin maneuvered slightly so he could peer out of their rooted hiding place when they heard something. It was a soft scraping, and it was getting louder. Sorin leaned forward, pulling the blanket with him, much to his brother's dismay, and pulled his pen from his pack. He held it at the ready, the hair on his arms raised, his breath stilled as his heart began to pump harder in his chest. Should he try to get out of the blankets? Probably. Too late for that now. From around the corner of the roots, Soren watched as the silhouetted figure emerged. The tension of the moment was lost in an instant. It was Brady. Even with mixed feelings about him, Soren had to admit he was glad of the father's return. Brady said nothing and instead dropped his borrowing bag at the edge of the hole they came through. Anything? asked Soren. Brady shook his head. Nothing. Everything is sealed up tight. There's a whole maze of walls in this place, muttered Brady, sinking against the wall and pressing his head to the concrete block. You went inside? Without us? asked Zorn. Brady nodded his head slowly, eliciting a sigh of mild frustration from Zorin. Ray and Dorian stirred at the sound of their father's voice and sat up shivering. Uh, of course, thought Zorin bitterly. Of course he would go without us, trying to prove himself or make up for what happened. Shame he didn't find any food while he was out. Anything would taste good at this point. The knot in Soren's gut wouldn't be satisfied with snow again. Even though his body shuddered uncontrollably for a moment, he managed to push himself to onto his feet. The eldest brother slipped on his borrowing bag as he readied himself. His younger brothers moaned in protest as their primary source of warmth left. I'm going to see what I can find, muttered Soren as he straightened the hook on his belt. Brady gave him a wary look. Don't be ridiculous. You should save your strength. We should just move on to the next home, said Brady. It's almost winter, Brady. We've got to settle long term here, at least for now. Regardless, we need some supplies. Don't go anywhere until I get back, said Soren stiffly. You all wait here while I go in and give it a once over. I'll be back before you know it, and when I get back, you had better not be asleep, Bobbins. Both Dorian and Ray pulled the covers up further by their chins as they nodded obediently at their brother's command. Zorin knew they were playing with him and didn't say anything else as he turned toward the gap between the roots of the tree they stayed under and the house not far from him. There was a moment of calm there by the roots. The wind was still, the sun was shining. The only thing that separated him from their new long-term home was a wide open gap about 15 feet long. Soren was surprised that Brady dared make the trek, but he would worry about that later. Instead, he closed his eyes and took in the environment. No one was out. All was quiet and still. No grinding gears, no animals, no one bothering those strange boxes humans have outside their doors. Now was the perfect time to go. Sorhan let himself feel fear just for a moment before darting out from behind the roots, his body filled with adrenaline as he willed his legs faster to the corner of the house. One misstep would have him skid across the ground, but Sorhan was dexterous and rarely tripped. Even with his frozen limbs, Sorhan made it to the edge of the house in record time. He was on the clock now. The borrower's eyes analyzed the edge of the house by the foundation quickly. They needed an entrance, and he found one tucked behind some bramble bushes where the vinyl had peeled away from the foundation, leaving a borrower-sized gap. Wasting no time, he shimmied through the gap into the walls of the house. The walls were only slightly warmer than their place by the tree roots. After wandering around, Soren finally found that there was a place he could climb from the crawl space to the passageways between the walls. What was even better was that there was a pile of rubble he could easily climb. Step by step, he carefully traversed the debris until he reached the first floor. From where he stood, he could stare up at the towering expanse above him. Just the sight of something so tall gave him the sense of vertigo. He couldn't even see the roof of the hall without some sort of light source, and he only had a few matches which he left behind for the boys. The bricks and drywall surrounding him 
did offer some limited light where the electrical outlets connected their world to the world of the humans. Soren shuddered at the thought of being seen by a human. His mother and father had told him stories of what happened to other borrowers who had encountered humans. The horror stories had been passed through generations. Whether some of these stories were true was always in debate. Still, it didn't stop Soren from always being careful, and he wasn't about to stop now. He wandered through the halls and ventured to the left when the passage split. Then he spotted something. Just ahead was an outlet onto the first floor. Soren took a calming breath before approaching the holes in the wires. Each wire, in of itself, was nearly as thick as his arm, making the hair on the back of his neck raise. Why does everything have to be so big for humans? He thought. Carefully, he pulled on the screw and unwound it, just enough for him to peer through so he could see inside the human world. The warmth from the room poured in through the minuscule crack Soren was able to create. He listened in. Nothing. He breathed deeply. There was the thick smell of mothballs and something else. A smell of a thick, scented powder wafted through the air. It was an unmistakable scent of litter. Cats. Soren pulled the plate back over and tightened the screw. I have to remember not to go in there unless I really need something. Soren jogged to the next few rooms, which he soon realized belonged to the same human because of the smell. We can stay in between these walls here and be unbothered as long as we don't go into the rooms. It's much warmer, at the very least, even if it does stink of cat litter. Soren felt his way along the walls and jogged through the darkness until he reached another break in the walls. These must divide the larger rooms, thought Soren. The next five rooms Soren checked turned up unusable since they were completely empty. Soren even dared to go outside of the walls and walk around the chilled rooms. The vast expanse of the room seemed endless and empty. It was unnerving and forced Soren to duck back into the confines of the walls. How can humans live in such a huge space? I know they're huge, but still. There were only a few abandoned spider webs and no signs of mice. Finally, after the long trek through the walls, Soren managed to find what he was looking for. A warm apartment kitchen left unattended. The outlet on the floor came out right beside the kitchen table. The chairs were covered with skirts that hid the legs, which made perfect hiding places. The kitchen itself was only 27 paces away. The counter, on the other hand, was another issue altogether. The surface was slick and covered with something called linoleum. Gaining purchase with a sick was going to be nearly impossible without leaving a mark. Soren glanced from side to side. A move this bold wasn't something he usually partook in but he was running out of options if he wanted to make sure his family ate today. Soren stepped out from behind the wall and walked the 27 paces to the edge of the wall next to the kitchen, empty and no signs of humans at the moment. The kitchen was small, but there were still two separate counters. One side had the sink while the other had the stove. Based on his experience, bread didn't do well next to water. Taking a shaking breath to swell his confidence, Soren darted from his place by the wall toward the stove while swinging his hook as hard as he could toward the top of the oven. Missed. He cursed under his breath and tried again, this time finding his hook catch something metal. I must have snagged the grate of the stove. I've got to be careful. Those move sometimes. Soren wasted no time and began climbing, his heart pounding as he rose further and further from the ground. Out of breath, he reached the top. He looked around. The place seemed clean and well put together. Soren shook his thoughts away. He couldn't think about that now. He returned his attention back to the counter in search of something he could grab and shove into his bag quickly. There. A bread box shoved in the corner by the wall and the counter. More importantly, there was an electrical outlet mere inches away from the box. Soren had hit the jackpot. Soren wrapped his hook and made quick work of getting into the box and pulled off enough breadcrumbs to hopefully be unnoticed. He wanted to take the entire end of the bread, but it would have been too much and was bound to be noticed by the humans. Even though many of them didn't take the ends of the bread unless the rest was gone, humans noticed when things like this went missing. Even now, Soren could only hope that what he took wouldn't be noticed. He pinched off more than what he usually would, but only because his brothers were at the forefront of his mind. Soren had just stepped back onto the counter when he heard a loud grinding sound coming from the next room just behind the door. His heart stopped 
and skipped a beat. Every nerve in his body screamed to run. The eldest brother couldn't hesitate now, but he had a choice. He could try and shimmy down his line to the cover he knew would lead him back, or he could pull free the electrical cover mere inches from himself. Soren made his choice. Climbing now would be too risky, and at least he could duck behind the top of the bread box, which was just barely taller than the backsplash. Hands trembling, he began frantically unscrewing the cover. It was already loose. There was a sound of a high-pitched, shrill sound followed by silence. Soren could guess it was a car coming to a stop. His hands fumbled as he managed to pry the screw loose and began to peel back the faceplate. Nearby, he could hear muffled shouting. Humans, two of them. They were angry by the sound of it. Maybe they would be distracted just long enough. At any rate, the borrower was about to find out. Soren pulled with all his might, accidentally stumbling backward when the plate came off suddenly. He could see the lock turning. It was now or never. He leapt to his feet, screw in hand, and bolted behind the faceplate cover. He straddled the electrical cords and managed to pull the faceplate back into place just as the door opened. Heart pounding through his ribs, Soren listened as the two humans, who were still shouting at one another, came into the apartment. He couldn't make out what they were saying, but at least he was out of harm's way, for now at least. There was a small shelf just below his feet, which he couldn't see before. Soren embedded his spare hook into the wood and rappelled down the line, and began jogging back to where he left his brothers and Brady. It was a close call, but it was a successful venture. His family would eat tonight, and that's what mattered. As his legs carried him, Soren couldn't help but think about why the humans were shouting at one another. How could they be angry when they had so much? They had food and shelter, warmth when they wanted. Soren rounded the final corner and dropped down from the ledge into the crawl space. He could feel the temperature difference instantly. On his way back, Soren decided something very important. While Soren might not have the years of experience Brady possessed, Soren had pure borrower instinct. He was determined this would be their new home, regardless of what Brady had to say about it. From now on, Soren was going to call the shots.